All right. Good afternoon. I'm going to be talking about standards. Now, that could be boring, but luckily, I can make it interesting. <laughs> We're going to be talking for about 15 minutes for the, the dynamics in the industry, evolving standards that affect VR and AR content developers, hopefully to enable your content to run really fast across many different platforms to reach the end users that you want to sell to. So why do we need uh, VR standards? If you look back to the 80s and 90s, the early days of VR, uh, everything was being vertically integrated. You know, one application running on one system, but now, of course, we're living in the future and we have VR that's wanting to be a high volume consumer market. And any consumer market selling applications has an insatiable need for content to drive end user demand. So the platform vendors really want to bring in as much content as they can onto their platform. So we can't really afford, as an industry, uh, siloed content where applications can only run on one or two of these VR platforms. You want everything to run everywhere. And going hand in hand in with that is consumer confidence. We want to avoid the VHS versus Betamax or the Blu-ray versus HD DVD uh, syndrome where consumers are not sure that if they invest, in some cases, a significant amount of money in a VR piece of hardware, are the content that they want going to run on that particular hardware? Or are they going to be locked out because, again, things are siloed? Standards can really help. Interoperability means that you can run, hopefully, much more content across many more platforms. And of course, for the application developers, that's excellent news. If we can make that happen as an industry, it means your investment in a title is going to be um, monetizable across many, other, many more pieces of hardware. So, so we all win. But often, I'm asked as we go around Kronos working on AR and VR, saying, well, what is going to be the standard for AR or VR? And the answer is there's going to be probably hundreds of relevant standards needed to create a real AR or VR system. I call it the constellation of AR, VR standards. There's everything from things like how you connect your HMD, what kind of connector shape do we use, and the IEEE, working on things like Wi-Fi, are we going to use for uh, connecting wireless headsets, they might be hidden well down underneath uh, the covers. So that might not be raised to the relevance of an application developer, but there are definitely application-facing standards that you will uh, come across. Uh, MPEG, for example, de developing VR video formats, W3C, bringing lots of AR and VR capability into your web browser. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And I'm here to talk about what Kronos is doing. We're, de we're developing acceleration APIs. So there are many, we call them SDOs, Standards Development Organizations. And each SDO tries to have a focus and expertise. And we try not to uh, overlap, because life's too short to, to duplicate work. Um, Kronos' particular expertise and focus is connecting software, application software, to underlying acceleration silicon. Uh, so we do this through runtime APIs, application programming interfaces. And we tend to focus on where we need acceleration most. So it tends to be things like 3D graphics, uh, the vision processing for virtual and augmented reality, uh, parallel processing in, in general, and increasing, increasingly for um, Many applications, things like neural network uh, acceleration uh, as well. We have about 130 companies, everyone from Apple and Google all the way down to uh, one person startups, coming together to create these standards for the good of their own business and the good for the greater industry. So, again, why do we need these standard acceleration APIs? I've already mentioned getting rid of fragmentation, portability. If all your hardware platforms are exposing the same APIs, you can just call the same API set and you'll hopefully run everywhere. But there's a more uh, subtle reason, particularly for AR and VR, that the last speaker I thought was excellently going through why you need to optimize and why you need to really worry about where your application is running on the CPU or the GPU. In general, you want to get as much of the low-level processing for rendering, for vision processing, off the CPU onto an accelerator. Because the accelerators have been designed for higher performance and lower power consumption. So 
particularly if you're in a mobile device. If you're running everything on the CPU, you know, your battery is going to disappear uh, quicker than you would like, and th as well as things running slower. And there's actually a good example. Uh, Pokemon Go was totally awesome, but if you actually read the press, you know, the, if you're a power user, you had to turn all the AR off because it was so heavy on the battery that it was not really usable. And that's a failure on behalf of the industry, particularly the silicon industry, um, which I kind of speak for, because we haven't enabled developers quite yet to offload effectively that kind of vision processing and AR processing off the CPU onto the GPU. That's what we're working towards, and we're getting closer. So what are the most, we have about, Kronos has about 15 different standards that we're developing. I've picked out ones that are most relevant to AR and VR. OpenVX is, it stands for vision acceleration. It's probably mainly relevant to AR, uh, but in VR you can use it for tracking and positioning, if you're doing inside out uh, tracking, for example. Um, reading in images from camera sensors, analyzing it, doing geometric scene reconstruction, and increasingly with neural nets doing semantic analysis of the scene so you know that this is not just a flat surface, you know it's a podium, so you know, I should stand behind it or not. So you know, th th we really want to the AR environments interacting with the real world to really begin to understand more about what they're interacting with. We have GLTF, which is with the exception to the rule, it's actually not an API, it's a file format, and I'll briefly mention that at the end. But the two I really want to focus on, because I only have a few minutes, OpenXR, which is an open AR, VR standard, mainly for the input side, uh, uh, trackers and sensors, and where we'll start, the 3D rendering side. So there's a number of standards out there, OpenGL, it's the granddaddy of 3D rendering APIs, um, and Probably if you're using uh, VR on a desktop machine, you're almost certainly using OpenGL today. In fact, the vast majority of 3D rendering for AR and VR in, in the world today is using one of these Kronos standards. OpenGL ES is a subset of OpenGL that's been designed for mobile phones, ships on pretty much every mobile phone in, in the known galaxy, and WebGL is bringing the capability of OpenGL ES into your web browser. Now, OpenGL was designed almost 25 years ago, so we're actually transitioning to a new uh, architecture, which is lower level, more explicit, higher performance, and lower latency, which is important for AR and VR. It's called Vulkan. And we're actually developing Vulkan now with AR and VR capability. Vulkan was released in February 2016, still quite new, uh, but it's already available on quite diverse uh, platforms. And in fact, at GDC uh, in March, just a few months ago, we released a bunch of extensions for Vulkan. I'm not going to go into the detail. The bottom line is the Vulkan capability for VR is now equivalent to OpenGL, because we've had in OpenGL for a long time things like multi-view. Again, the last speaker was talking about how you want to optimize and, if possible, use your GPU to generate both eyes simultaneously. Well, now OpenGL and Vulkan have that capability built into the API itself. And that gives the opportunity for the GPU vendor to do that as optimally as they can using their own hardware architecture. So, and lo lots of other stuff for AR and VR has been now built into, into Vulkan. So, Kronos APIs are used for the 3D rendering. What about the input side? This is what I mentioned earlier, OpenXR. A lot of people ask, why do we choose XR? No, are we betting that XR is going to be the industry name? We just chose XR because we want this to be relevant to A, AR, and VR. So, X means any, any R you want. Um, so, and this, this is probably my best slide. <laughs> so, on the left-hand side, we talk about the fragmentation that we wanted to avoid. This is where, unfortunately, today we have fragmentation. If you look at all the different VR runtimes, you know, the Oculus, you know, Steam VR, uh, Daydream, we heard about earlier this afternoon on Android, Samsung Gear VR, they're all doing this similar kind of things. They're letting you do, do discover devices, uh, doing tracking of the headset, of handheld controllers. Uh, they might be uh, letting you process haptics. 
Um, they will be passing back parameters so the rendering system knows what to do for the optics that you're using. They're all doing kind of the same thing, but they're all using different APIs facing the, the application to do it. And there's no real reason, there's no added value largely for those different APIs. It's just the fact that we haven't been talking yet. And so an application is faced with, well, I've developed on Oculus, now I want to ship on SteamVR. I have to rewrite to another whole set of APIs. It's not really adding value, it's just putting friction into the industry. So OpenXR, we have an application-facing interface that all of the runtimes can agree on and they will all hopefully expose it. And that means a VR application or an engine like Unity no longer has to write to all of these different hardwares. And we can just write once and it'll run everywhere. But it's actually another problem that, again, perhaps is less obvious, that the device manufacturers also have an issue. If I'm creating a new hand tracker, you know, perhaps using a new innovative kind of camera, um, I have a similar kind of problem. At the moment, I have to go and beg, borrow, and steal the cycles from each of the runtime vendors to, for them to integrate my new device into their runtime. And you know, the runtime vendors are pretty busy people, so you know, that can be, can be tricky. OpenXR also has a downward-looking device layer interface, which enables a new device manufacturer to self-integrate. They can write the OpenXR driver, and then it'll just plug into an OpenXR compatible runtime. So device manufacturers can also you know, get much better market reach than they could uh, without these interoperability standards. So uh, is OpenXR shipping yet? No, it's not. Uh, we started design, detailed design work in December. And these things normally take 12 to 18 months. So you can do, you can do the math. It's getting closer. So right now, really, one of the most interesting things is who is helping to develop this standard, um, because it's not a guarantee, but it's an indicator of who might actually ship it with their runtimes when the standard is complete. And the good news is we have pretty well everyone who's anyone. So HTC, Oculus, Valve, uh, Google, you know, Epic, Unity, all the GPU vendors uh, are there. Sony is there as well, which is interesting. Um, not Microsoft, not Apple. They're the only two that are missing. P pretty much everyone else in the industry. So, so again, people say, OK, OpenXR sounds cool. But does that mean, does, that, does it replace the runtime? And the answer is no. There's, the runtimes will need to continue to exist. And there'll be a lot of investment and added value in those runtimes for the different platforms. But OpenXR simply provides the choice for those runtimes now to expose the application and the device facing interfaces, which means that those runtimes will be, have access to more applications and more devices. So those runtimes will benefit, and the applications and the devices will benefit. So it seems to be an upward virtuous spiral where every, everyone wins. So we're hoping that OpenXR will enjoy uh, pretty rapid uh, adoption. The last thing, actually, second from last thing, the, the people also ask, well, does X OpenXR then replace Unity? The answer is no. Uh, the, we have a very layered ecosystem, which is a good thing. La layered ecosystem is very flexible, very powerful. So we have these native APIs down here at the bottom. Um, we have middleware like Unity or uh, Unreal. Uh, a native VR app can use Unity. Many people do, do, of course. Unity will use the underlying APIs. Or, of course, you can. If you're being more adventurous, you can use the underlying APIs directly. I wanted to briefly mention the web, because bringing AR and VR into the web is going to be the metaverse, where everything is connected. You can download interstitial AR and VR experiences very quickly. So bringing capabilities into the web, I think, is an important part of the evolution of the AR and VR industry. WebGL runs over OpenGL ES, and a 3D web application can use it directly. But there's middleware there, too, in, in the web. 3.js is kind of like the unity for the web. Most uh, 3D content on, in your browser will use 3.js. But now we're also beginning to see VR middleware and drivers beginning to appear in the web stack. WebVR is kind of equivalent to OpenXR. 
uh, also calls WebGL, and we have middleware like A-Frame that lets people construct VR experiences very simply to run in the web stack. My last slide here. I will do a quick shout out to GLTF, although it's not an API. I think it's going to be in, in a vital part of AR and VR in, on any platform. Probably most the web, though, because the web, by definition, you have to download stuff. Um, we have standards for different media types, you know, audio, video, images. We have the well-known standards. 3D has not had a standard. And that means if you have a, a 3D site over here and a 3D site over there, are they going to use different 3D data formats? That does mean your application has to understand or uh, different formats for every site or application you go to. That's horrible fragmentation. We want to avoid that. And GLTF is a 3D file format that is specifically designed for compact, efficient, transmission from client, uh, from server to client, uh, very easy unpacking. And we've just launched GLTF 2.0, which has PBR, physically based rendering, and um, means you can have very nice looking PBR based models that are, can be portably rendered across any of these runtimes. So that's it. Um, Kronos is a non-profit. We're an open standards organization. Anyone can join. If, if any of this is interesting to you, please consider joining. You'll be very welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh. Well, why aren't Apple and Microsoft joining such value? Um, so they do. They are actually members. And it does depend on the standard. So for example, GLTF. Microsoft is a spec editor, and they're going to be using it for bringing 3D into Microsoft Office, which is actually a pretty big deal. Um, but they, they are the big platform owners, so you know, they can try to go proprietary if they think that's in their best business interest, and of course they should if, that, if they think that's true. Android, though, is very interesting, because Android is much more open standards based. They're using Vulkan. They're, they're the spec editor for OpenXR. And of course, Android is the largest platform in the galaxy. You know, it's 85% now of the mobile is Android. So I'm hoping that Android will be kind of the flag bearer for high volume standards based VR and AR. Thank you. Yep.